Welcome to Trash Imagination, a podcast about reimagining trash. I'm Carla Brown. Today I'm going to do something different from my previous 84 episodes. I'm going to talk about one creative reuse artist instead of deep diving into a specific type of material or another theme. The artist is Sayaka Gans. She makes large wildlife sculptures from plastic items like spatulas, hangers, spoons, toys, and bowls. And last year, I made a list of the five creative reuse artists from around the world who I would most like to meet. And Sayaka was on my list. And as a result, I have been keeping track of where she is doing her exhibits. And wouldn't you know, she just opened a an exhibit at Towson University in Baltimore, Maryland, which is about a two hour drive from my home. And so when I learned about that exhibit, I quickly messaged her and she very generously offered to meet with me. Hooray! Unfortunately, I did not record our conversation for this podcast. And that was because we were always in noisy places during our time together. So I will do my best to summarize our fascinating discussion. If you want to hear more of her story, I will share plenty of great video interviews that she has done on other occasions in the show notes. So to start, let me tell you about Sayaka's life and how she came to this place of making sculptures from plasticware. So she was born in Japan and she moved a few times during her childhood to Brazil and Hong Kong. And as you know, I attended an international school when I was a teenager and I could sense that her experiences living in multiple cultures had had a big impact on her, similar to my experience living in a multicultural environment. And it makes you really think about things with new perspectives. When Sayaka was a kid, she loved puzzles. And you can see how that led to her work piecing together sculptures from many little bits of plastic. She also learned about the Shinto worldview, that objects have spirits. She tells a story about how she learned from a young age that when something is thrown away, when it still has life, that object will weep in the trash at night. Sayaka studied printmaking at the University of Indiana and then later did her master's in fine arts at Bowling Green State University. She now lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana with her husband Christopher who is also an artist. I have been following her work for many years and something that stays consistent through almost all her work is the idea of motion. For her MFA exhibit, she made two big, beautiful horses that look like they are leaping out of the wall. She also made a cheetah named Fogo from red plasticware. In all these pieces and many more, the animals are in motion. Sometimes this is communicated by the angles of their bodies, like their legs, their wings, fins, tails, or their heads. Sometimes it's because Sayaka attaches extra pieces like twisted wires that seem to shoot out from the animal. And they look like the lines in a comic book when something is moving fast and it says whoosh. To make her sculptures anatomically accurate and to capture their motions, Sayaka gathers photos of animals in motion. She needs to see a certain pose from many angles. And like Sayaka, I save many images for inspiration. So when I was preparing to go see her, I quickly sorted through my saved images of wildlife to see if I had any good photos of animals in motion that I could give her. And I was surprised to find that even though I have many, many wildlife images, almost none were in motion. So it makes sense that it's easier to take a photo of an animal when it is not moving, but it goes to show that it can be quite challenging to find the images that she needs to do her work. I also think it's interesting that the focus of her work is about motion, and yet what she's making are sculptures that don't normally move. So that has to be communicated with line and shape. And I mean, these things are bolted to the wall or hanging from the ceiling, but they are not actually moving. So it's quite an effort to make it look like they are moving. 
One of the reasons I really wanted to see her work in person was to understand more about how she constructs them. And I had seen videos where she showed the metal armature that she puts inside the sculptures to give them strength. So she welds those armature by herself. And in fact, her journey to make these sculptures started with a one day welding class. So she aims to keep the metal armature in her sculptures to a minimum. And she works hard to ensure that the lines of the armature flow with the movement of the animal. Now for some animals, that's pretty straightforward. So for example, when she wants to make a penguin, she welds something that looks like a football. But for other animals, it's complicated. For the cheetah, it would have been much easier to weld an armature with some connecting pieces that went kind of like up and down. But the lines of the cheetah are all side to side. So she, as I said, sets a goal of keeping the lines going all in the right direction. And to achieve that goal with the cheetah, she had to weld the armature kind of like a zigzag spring. I recommend that you look at the photos in the show notes to see what I mean. I was also intrigued by the armature for the horses. First of all, when I looked at the photos of the horses, I couldn't really see how they were attached to the wall. But what's great when you're in person, you can go right up to it. And I actually took a close up shot. Um, They are bolted to the wall and then they have this very solid hoof shape that goes down on the floor. And so that's why these really large sculptures, even though they look sort of fragile, they're just balanced on one leg, they actually look quite sturdy when you are in person. So to attach the plastic wear to the armature, Sayaka uses electrical wire, which comes in many colors, so then she can color match it to the plastic wear. And she also uses color-coded zip ties, especially when she's on the road and she might not have access to her wire collection. When we first met at the exhibit, she took some time to fix a few pieces on the sculptures which had come loose during transport. And it was funny to see her wrestling with the sculptures sculptures because usually when you are in a gallery you aren't supposed to touch anything and I had actually spent the last 45 minutes before that like very gingerly walking around the gallery taking photos from all different angles and I was really careful not to bump into the sculptures but here she was sticking her hands into the guts of the sculptures and drilling new holes into them in some cases to fix the pieces that had come loose. And she told me that sometimes when she's fixing a sculpture, it makes her want to change how it was put together originally. But of course, that's very challenging because her pieces are like puzzles where every item fits into all the other items. And in fact, when she is designing these sculptures in her studio and she changes her mind about a component of the sculpture, this is very tedious. She might have to untie a whole bunch of other pieces just so she can access the piece that she wants to remove. And she says that in her work, removing items is just as important as adding items. So Sayaka has done many exhibits in botanic gardens, which really suits her work because they are wildlife. And the sculptures look like they could be in the jungle or in a coral reef. And in recent years, many of her newer sculptures have been whales and other sea life because people really like these exhibits with an underwater theme. And when I asked her what types of plastics she is most excited to find when she is searching for materials, she said it was any piece that was was translucent blue because, first of all, they're hard to find and also because these work really well for marine mammals. And she also loves these plates that are designed to serve deviled eggs. And she was describing it to me. They have like a scalloped edge and then the eggs sort of sit in a circle around a central bowl. And these deviled egg platters, the reason she loves them so much is they are the perfect shape for her jellyfish sculptures. So one of my favorite parts of talking with Sayaka was when we were comparing notes about working with plastic when we were making art, because I don't know that many other artists who drill and cut plastic as much as I do. So it was lovely to find someone else who understands the joy of finding a purple plastic cap, for example. And when you work with a lot of plastic when you're making art, you learn it has many quirks. And you learn just by picking up a certain item, whether that item is like 
likely going to work in the sculpture you want to make. And you know which pieces are likely to split when you drill them. And Sayaka says there's even a type of kitchenware that looks like plastic, but it actually has a core that is something else and you can't even drill it at all. And she has learned that the plastic color that fades the fastest is red and that she really only wants plastic wear that is curvilinear and somewhat flexible so that she can work them into the body shapes of her animals. We also talked about the challenges of storing materials when you work with recycled plastic. She stores her materials in about 40 bins sorted by color. And for a few projects, there has been community engagement where people bring in plastics. But that can be challenging too because often you get a lot of plastic that you can't really use because it's hard to communicate exactly what you need and there is so much variability with plastic. There is also an interesting challenge with plastic as you make larger pieces. So Sayaka has described her work as 3D impressionism, and she sees each piece of plastic kind of like a brush stroke in a painting. And when she's making a whale that is four feet long, she needs plastic ware that is a certain size. But when she makes a whale that is 16 feet long, she needs to find plastic ware that is bigger. The brush strokes need to make sense depending on the size of the finished piece. So scaling up her work means she needs to collect different types of materials, which also means more storage space. And you really need to collect twice as much plastic as you need for the finished product because, as I said, it's like a puzzle and you have no idea which pieces will make the final cut. So originally my hope was just to see Sayaka's exhibit and to meet her, but then the next day she was participating in an event called the Charm City Night Market, which is a festival in downtown Baltimore, which featured performances, delicious food, and a whole section of visual artists demonstrating their work. So she asked if I would like to come and help teach people how to make earrings, necklaces, and bracelets from plastic cutlery at that event. And so I said, that sounds interesting. I want to learn by working with her right there in person. What a great opportunity. So here's how we helped people make the jewelry. Uh, They would pick out uh, spoons, forks, or knives from this huge collection of plastic cutlery. And then we would show them how to cut them with these snips to a shape that they liked. And then they would file down the rough edges with a metal file. And then they would tell us where they wanted us to drill a hole. So we would do the drilling. And finally, we helped them attach eyelets and other earring components or bracelet components or um, we showed them how to make an adjustable necklace with very simple knots and the results were surprisingly beautiful and professional looking. So during that time I asked Sayaka about her experiences teaching others how to make 3D sculptures from plastic ware. I mean she has taught a general sculpture class which was not about plastic ware specifically. Um, so she loved teaching that and she does love teaching. However she said it does take a specific kind of student to want to work with plastic ware because it takes so long to find it and clean it and sort it and the student student really needs to love that part of the process, which can be quite tedious unless you love it. And she jokes that often she finds she has spent like three hours sorting or snipping plastic wear and the time has flown by, but there's not a lot to show for it. And you know, this is, I can totally get that. That happens to me all the time when I'm working with my recycled materials. So the ideal student would need to be totally good with all that preparation work and then they have to also really be interested in the very slow process of building a puzzle where the puzzle pieces don't really fit together based on anything except your intuition. So Sayaka and I bring, I think, a similar spirit to this work of creative reuse. Like me, she believes that we will motivate people to make a change in their consumption habits by staying positive and focusing on what we can make from these materials. And she said that change is like a marathon and the only way that people are going to last through that marathon is if they are inspired. And that's what I'm trying to do here with the Trash Imagination podcast. 
podcast. So thank you for listening. I hope you are inspired by Sayaka's story. If you live near Baltimore, Maryland, her exhibit is at the Asian Art and Culture Center at Towson University until December 8th, 2019, and it's free to visit. So until next time, may you see plastic wear as a source of art in your life. <laughs>